Good morning. Well, uh, last Saturday I broke my wrist. Some of you questioned my accounting that I broke it water skiing, so I brought evidence, video evidence today. All right, so last Saturday I went out to uh, the Willamette. This is the West Lynn Slalom Course. Uh, the object is to get, you get 14 points, one point going through the entrance buoy, then there's six sets of double buoys. You want to get around the outside buoy to get two points. So uh, there we go. And, uh, and then you have to go through uh, the exit buoy to get, so you get 14 points. So I made a perfect score of 14. That was at 27 miles an hour. Then I came back at 28 miles an hour, got a perfect score. And then I went back the other way, 29 miles an hour, did perfectly. Then 30 miles an hour, did perfectly. Then, nah, no, let's not do that again, Cody. Can we uh, not do that one? Is there another one you got? Show the round where I uh, broke my wrist. Uh, you got that one? Here we go. See? That's it. That's how it happened. So let's have no more stories about me climbing up a ladder and falling off a ladder, okay? That's just <laughs> stupid. Nobody would do something that crazy. So that story's out. This is the official, okay? Got my uh, hand caught in the handle of the rope. All right. Imagine you go on a vacation, the Oregon coast. It could be Hawaii, it could be Mexico. You come out on your uh, hotel deck and you see a woman out in the water yelling for help. Uh, she goes underwater for a while, then she bobs back up and screams, Help! You look around, there's other people on decks, both sides of you, on the beach, just standing there watching, but nobody's moving a muscle. You realize this lady is in serious trouble and you got to take action. So you yank off your shirt, you sprint down to the water, you dive into the surf, you try to keep your eyes on her as you come up out of the, the waves, and you swim out to her, and when you get to her, she's desperate. She's a deathly shade of blue, and you turn her on her back, you, you, you put your arm around her and, and pull her to your chest, and you start swimming in. When you get into... Uh, where you can touch, then you carry her through the surf and you bring her and you set her on uh, the beach and her family, who had been watching the whole thing helplessly, run up to her with tears in their eyes. They give her a huge hug and they thank you profusely. As you walk back to your hotel room, you see all these people just standing there who had watched the whole thing. And some of them shout out, hey, way to go. But you can't get out of your mind, how often have you stood watching like those people with your arms folded, seeing someone you know drowning? Maybe in an addiction, or pornography, or in a broken marriage, or financial troubles, or grief, or doubt, and you didn't do anything. You can't get it out of your mind. Why do you say you care about people when you're not willing to take the risk to help them and point them to Jesus? This is the second in a three-week series called Taking the Risk to Point People to Jesus. We're asking the question, what will it take to get us to take the risk to point people to Jesus this year? And today I want to talk about taking the risk to step out of our comfort zone. Why are so many of us unwilling to risk pointing people to Jesus? Sometimes it might be that we're judgmental. So we think there are some people that God doesn't care about. If I were to take a straw poll of what kind of people God cares about? I guess there would be general agreement in the room. You'd say, yeah, God cares about Pope Francis, Rick Warren, Andy Stanley. They're fine people. But if I were to ask about Nicholas Cruz, the Parkland 
Florida shooter or Jared Ramos, the Washington, D.C. Capitol Gazette shooter, many would question if God has any use for them. We all carry around unpublished lists of people we think God can't possibly care too much about. Child pornographers, drug peddlers, terrorists, serial killers, rapists. Although we may not ver verbalize it, we think God has no use for people like that, and neither do I. One day, Jesus was teaching in a large metropolitan area, and he had a huge group of people around him. The spiritually confused, the unconvinced, morally bankrupt. Beside him was a group of religious people who were complaining that Jesus was associating with such people. How dare Jesus care about and spend time with people like that, they muttered under their breath. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he moved the crowd of people over to the religious people and told a story about a man who had a hundred sheep and he lost one. And so he left the 99 in an open field and he went and hunted down the one. And shepherds who were standing there and even the religious people said, yeah, that's what you do. And so he told them another story about a woman who had ten coins and she lost one. And so she swept the whole house until she found that one coin. And everybody listening to him said, yeah, that, that's right. If you lose your purse or your wallet, you don't give up until you find it. People were still listening. So Jesus told them another story about a man who had two sons. And the younger son got stars in his eyes and vision of fast lane living. So he came to his dad and he said, Dad, you're going to give me an inheritance someday, right? Why don't you give it to me now? I mean, Dad, you're, you're so healthy. By the time you pass away, I'll be so old, it won't be worth it to receive an inheritance. So just give me this stuff now. I mean, the problem is, Dad, you just won't die. I want it now. I mean, the relationship is broken. The son never takes his earbuds out. It was an unbelievable request. But even more unbelievable was the response of the father. Even though he had a pretty good idea what the son was going to do, he gave him the inheritance. Well, sure enough, after turning the property into cash, the young man packed his bags and took off for some fast lane living. He bought a condo and a car. He was living the dream. He had lots of friends as long as he had his money, but as soon as the inheritance ran out, he found out that fast lane friends don't hang around when the money's gone. Jesus tells us the boy took a job as a minimum wage, mystheos. It's the Greek word for the lowest level of worker. The bottom rung of the ladder, feeding pigs, which his Hebrew religion abhorred. He was so hungry, he was willing to eat the carob pods. Even the pigs refused. Then the son came to his senses. He said, my goodness, my father's workers, they do far better than me. I'll go back, I'll ask forgiveness, and I'll go to work for my dad. This is uh, Luke chapter 15. Verse 20, the reason I'm sharing with you this story is this story has moved me more than any other in the Bible to care about people in my life that don't know Jesus. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
The father's saying, I'm not going to wait until you've paid off your debt. I'm not going to wait until you've duly groveled. You're not going to earn your way back into the family. I'm just going to accept you back. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. As he came up to the road to his father's house, his father came running down to greet him. He didn't wait on the porch, impatiently tapping his foot, saying, here comes that son of mine. After what he's done, he better have a heartfelt apology. It was considered undignified for an older man to run, but this father's legs wouldn't move fast enough to get down to his son and to show him how much he loved him. The son said, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. The father interrupted him and said, Shh, don't talk like that. He didn't give his son the chance to clean up his life. He didn't even give him time to make his repentance speech. All he could think about was getting him home again. About six years ago, our son Mark was a sophomore at Portland State, and he wasn't doing very well. Every semester, he would sign up for a full load, like 16 hours. By the end of the semester, he'd be down to six. He'd drop classes or flunk out of others. And his problem wasn't not being smart. He's extremely smart. He said he was partying. So we went to the beach one weekend. I think nine of us went. We have a large family, and uh, we invited Mark, and he said, I'll meet you down there. But he never showed. So we drove home on a Monday morning. We came into the house, and Mark and his girlfriend were there. And the house was a mess. Every bed was torn up. And we have a large family, so I think we can sleep 18. Every bed, including our master bedroom. There was jungle juice on the carpet. We had white carpet at the time. Jory looked it up on Facebook. Sure enough, big party at our house the night before. We felt totally violated. I sat down with Mark and I said, Mark, we're not going to do this any longer. Tomorrow I want you to go and sign up for one of the branches of the military. And I listed them in order of what I thought would be most safe. I said, Coast Guard, first choice. Air Force, second choice, Navy, third choice, Marines, Army. So the next morning he went out, he signed up for the Army. A couple months later, went to basic training. Four months later, they shipped him to Afghanistan, the most dangerous place in the world. Every day I pray, God, bring him back. I mean, if he would have died or lost a limb, I would have felt terrible the rest of my life because I'm the one that forced him, basically. After his first tour, he said, Dad, it was so crazy. I I swear they were trying to get us killed. They would drop us off in the morning in a plateau where we had Taliban and Al-Qaeda all around the hills looking at us. And we weren't allowed to shoot at them unless they shot at us first. It was so stupid. After a second tour, he came home and he left the military and he flew into the Portland airport and Jory and I picked him up. He came off and Jory gave him a hug. I swear your hug lasted two minutes. It was beautiful to watch. And then it was my turn. All I could think about was getting Mark home again. Jesus told three parables, rapid fire, one after the other. All three have a common thread. In each case, something of value is missing. The missing sheep matter to the shepherd. The missing coin mattered to the woman. Jesus is a brilliant storyteller. He talks about a woman to draw in the women. 
and the missing son matter to the father. When Jesus finished the three stories, I think a light went on in each listener's mind. They're thinking, here we are, looking down our noses because Jesus is spending time with people we think are worthless. When Jesus... Listeners put the stories together. I think they were blown away with God's love. Notice that the father ran to his son. Whatever else you believe about God, don't miss this. Right now, God is running to you to enfold us in his arms. This is how... Our Savior sees every person you work with, every person in your algebra class, every person on your sports team, every person in your neighborhood, every person in your family. Jesus is saying, you want to know what God's like? Look at the Father in this parable. It is God's love that compels us to step out of our comfort zone. You don't find this kind of grace in any other religion. Buddhists have a similar story, but it doesn't end the same way. When the wayward son comes back, he works for 25 years scooping dung to work off his debt. It's also impossible for a parable like this to emerge from Islamic circles. Family shame is very significant in Islam. The level of shame... From the young man leaving his father would have been intolerable. And if he did come back, he'd be on his hands and knees before Allah. And there'd be great penance to play if he lived at all. To find salvation, Muslims are required to keep the five pillars. Uh, Admit that there's no other God but Allah. Pay 2.5% of your assets to the mosque or Islamic charity. Uh, Make the pilgrimage to Mecca, pray five times a day, and keep the fast of Ramadan. If you do these five, are you guaranteed getting into paradise? No. It's still up to Allah. There's no guarantee that He'll honor the scales. If your good deeds outweigh your bad, maybe... The only way to be assured of getting into heaven is to die on a pilgrimage to Mecca or lose your life in jihad. That's one of the reasons there are so many recruits today willing to give their lives in jihad. If you're not in the habit of attending church regularly, this text tells you you matter immensely to God. Everybody is a somebody to God. Jesus also shared this parable to show us that God wants us to love people the way he does. He was addressing religious leaders who objected that he ate with prostitutes and tax collectors. Jesus says, shame on you. You should welcome people into God's family the way my father does. This is what we call a double-edged parable. That means there's two stories. The first story is about a son who leaves the family and does some fast living, runs out of money and comes to his senses. He comes back, asks his dad to forgive him. His dad accepts him back. The second part of the story is about the older son. He's mad that the father accepts back the younger son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. That's exactly where we expect to find him. While the younger son is off blowing all the family money, he's keeping the farm. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. He was angry about all the fanfare over the return of his worthless brother. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. 
But when this, son, when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitute, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. He says, you've never given me as much as a goat for a party with my friends. Now you've given him a, a calf. <clears throat> He's adding things up. I've worked myself to death <clears throat> to get what I've got. But my brother, who's done nothing to earn anything, and you throw him a party. Where's the justice in that? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus points this parable at older brother types who begrudged him for extending the kingdom to people with whom he didn't, they didn't think he should associate. Jesus points this parable at us today and asks, why can't you love and forgive people and welcome them into your church like my father does? The gravitational pull in every church is toward the paying customer. Always toward the connected. Toward the 99. Not the one. It's always toward the people who are already here. It's, all, it's always toward people who are already in the youth group. Not the students that don't know Christ. The older brother was angry. He wouldn't go into the party. He believed that he had lived a good life. So the father owed him. The first sign that you have an older brother's spirit is that when your life doesn't go the way you want, you aren't just sorrowful, but you're angry. You believe that if you live a good life, you should get a good life. If this is your thinking, you're going to be furious with God when things don't go the way you think they should. You don't deserve this. You will think after how hard you've worked to be a decent person. If you're a regular churchgoer, <clears throat> these parables tell you that you should love people the way God does. The Apostle Paul said that it was the love of God that compelled him to take the risk to tell people about Jesus 2 Corinthians, for the Christ love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. It's God's love that compels us to step out of our comfort zone. It was God's love for Paul, for all people that compelled Paul to step out of his comfort zone to try to reach people for Jesus. We read about the Apostle Paul in our journal this week. 1 Corinthians 9, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul says that he was willing to take the risk to build relationships with all different kinds of people that he might win some to Christ. Jesus wants us to follow Paul's example and step out of our comfort zones this year. To win as many people as possible to Jesus. Isn't that the whole point? To take as many people at work or on our sports team or in our classes or in our neighborhood or in our families with us to heaven? Step out of your comfort zone to develop relationships with people. Show, surveys show that the longer you attend church, the less likely, the less non-Christian friends you're likely to have. 
So we have to step out of our comfort zone, make conscious attempts to build relationships with people who probably don't know Christ. Taking, stepping out of our comfort zones takes some risk, but it's so worth it. People will thank you for the rest of their lives. There's nothing more exciting than seeing a life that's changed or changing. Uh, maybe you were here with us uh, about, I don't know, nine months ago when Lily Bounds was baptized right up here. She gave her life to Christ last year and she told her story in front of us. But watch this. This is, she tells kind of the backstory of what led her to Christ. Hi, my name is Lily Bounds. I am 22 years old and my dad is the bass player for Portland Community Church. I've been attending mm, probably for about a year now. I have gone occasionally in years prior, but not regularly, that it was only recently that I started attending more often. So I was first brought to church when I was knee high to a grasshopper, probably about five or six years old, really small, and I went to a Lutheran preschool. And I was an unholy terror, I hated it, and I didn't want to be there, and I didn't want to sing those songs, and I didn't want to do anything that anyone told me to. Um, and that continued probably up until I was in middle school, and I just... I knew that Christianity was a thing because I had been forced to go to church and I feel like that was really a big part of it was that I was continually forced and that it was you have to go, you have to do this and I just didn't want to and there was no real reason for it. It wasn't because I didn't believe in a God. I've always thought that there had to be a higher power of some sort. It, it's a little absurd to think otherwise. I just didn't know the right way. I didn't know what exactly was the creator or who did it. And all throughout middle school and high school career, I tried to be as upbeat and happy as I could, but deep down I knew that I felt really, really isolated and alone feelings of loneliness and anxiety and just constantly upset because I just didn't have anything. I don't like that. I don't want to be alone. I want to have a group. I want to have somewhere where I feel like I belong. That was when I started really paying attention to the strange bouts of luck I would have. There was a time where I was stranded on top of a mountain at New Year's with like a dislocated hip pretty much and I was I had no phone I had no way to get home and I went through a weird series of events that there is no way that it happened by coincidence it had to have been guided up and I got home I walked six miles through the snow and managed to get exactly where I was supposed to be. And that then made me realize that I was never alone. That even though I felt alone, that was kind of my own doing because I was pushing God away. And that's probably where all those feelings were coming from because I just was working so hard to say no that it was just me isolating myself. That even when life is hard and I don't wanna, and there's all sorts of things that just seems impossible, I know I'm not alone and that I can get through it and that it's gonna be okay. It's God's love for people like Lily, for people like the son in the parable, and God's love for us that compels us to step out of our comfort zone. Let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for the story you told that shows us how much you love us, how willing you are to forgive us and accept us back. And that love for us, and we realize you love everybody else just as much, compels us to want this year to take the risk to point people to Jesus. You moved by God today that you want to tell him, God, I want to take the risk this year. Why don't you tell him that right now? Say, God, uh, not really comfortable, but I know you love all the people I know at school, work, family, and I want to point some of them to you this year, and I, I'm willing to do that. You tell him that right now. Or if you've never given your life to Christ, say thank you that you love me just like that son in the parable. I want you in my life. Would you please come in, Lord Jesus? Thank you, God, for your love for us. And we're compelled to tell others. In Jesus' name we pray.